Welcome to the podcast for Gateway Baptist Church. You're listening to a message from our Mackenzie campus. Find us at gatewaybaptist.com.au if you'd like to connect with us as we seek to change lives by following Jesus in our community, our nation, and our world. Hey, I'd love to start this morning with a question for you. If you need some wisdom in your life, where do you go? That's the question that I just want you to think about. If you're on the uh, online joining us, why don't you put it in the chat? But back in the day, my early 20s, uh, my friends and I kind of created, I don't know, like a, a Knights of the Round Table, wise council kind of thing where we would clear out the garage uh, of the house that we were living in. We'd bring out all of our chairs and we would sit in a circle and we would discuss Uh, whatever the question, the problem, or the topic was that someone wanted to discuss. Like basically what you could do is if you had an issue that you just wanted to work through, you could text the boys and be like, guys, I need a garage session, which I think we could have come up with a better name, I'm sure, but that was what we had for it. I need a garage session and we would decide, we would clear out the garage and, uh, and get together and make this happen. Now we would discuss a whole variety of different things. We'd discuss everything from uh, what's the difference between envy and jealousy, Uh, which we slowly figured out eventually. Uh, Which gospel would we recommend to a new Christian? We even discussed which sport God prefers, and we realized it's AFL, so that's good to know. Um, It's actually, that's his preferred sport. I know the union players say that that's the sport they play in heaven, but we confirmed it's not. Um, But it was our goal that when this happened, we would spend as much time as we needed to get to the bottom of the problem, the topic, or the discussion uh, that we needed to have. And as you can imagine, a room full of boys in their early 20s was a minefield of gold, you know, just like so much wisdom uh, floating around that room. I'm surprised we didn't solve uh, world hunger, the refugee crisis, and world peace all at the same time, just with that collective brain power and insight in the one place. But as much as we joke, it was the place that I would go to when I was uh, needing a little bit of wisdom. And the reason for that was because we all knew it was available for us at any time, any point. It was full of guys who loved Jesus. It was uh, also full of people who knew that we wanted the best for one another. And uh, we were willing to sit there and do whatever it took to get there uh, in the end. So that is where I would go in my early 20s when I needed some wisdom. But my question again for you this morning is, when you need some wisdom, where would you go? Because let's be real, trying to navigate life is not necessarily a simple task. It's not super easy, and there's not a very clear roadmap all the time on what to do in a whole variety of different situations and circumstances. See, sometimes even just trying to get good financial advice is difficult. I remember at the start of the pandemic, getting an email from the Commonwealth Bank with some uh, forecasts for the property market that anticipated that most properties would decrease in value by 30% over the next 18 months. I don't know if any of you know anything about the property market at the moment, but it's done almost the exact opposite of that. And I thought maybe those guys would be the ones who would be able to give me some good financial advice. I remember getting advice from a friend of mine as a teenager that if I wanted to attract the girl that I wanted, I needed to be indifferent towards her because that would drive her insane. You know, she, she was like, oh, why doesn't he want me? I want him more now. I, I, unfortunately, she just thought I didn't like her, so she moved on and found another guy. So he wasn't very helpful either. But it can actually be quite hard to find a good source of wisdom. People are offering it for sure. You know, there's plenty of people saying that they've got some wisdom for your relationships, for your finances, for your career. And don't get me wrong, some of these people do have some real wisdom and insight to offer on these topics. But where do you go for wisdom for your life? For your relationships, for your spiritual needs, for your overarching principles of how you treat your money? Where is your main source of wisdom? Where do you go when you are in a pinch? And today we're going to uh, look at a psalm, Psalm chapter 1, well, Psalm, psalm 1, it's not chapter 1, it's just Psalm 1, but this psalm is actually what is considered a wisdom psalm. Now, I'll be honest, I genuinely didn't know that was a category of psalm until I read a commentary about this. I knew about the psalms of lament, you know, the ones where they talk about their sorrow and their grief and their pain, and they bring that before God. I knew about the, songs of thank, uh, the psalms of thanksgiving that are all about thanking God for the good things that he's done, and the psalms of praise that are all about praising God for his character, but a Apparently, there is a category of psalms called the Psalms of Wisdom. And in it, what happens is the psalmist addresses the difference between those who follow God and His commandments and those who don't. 
And so these Psalms are trying to give general wise counsel for leading a godly life. So if we're here this morning asking ourselves as we step into 2022, where do we get our wisdom from? How are we going to make our decisions this year? You can understand why it might actually be helpful to look at a wisdom psalm, Psalm 1. And so to start, I just want to look at genuinely the first four words of this psalm. Psalm 1, verse 1 says this, Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. Now the reason I want to stop here is just to unpack this first word, blessed. Now, it's a word that has a lot of modern connotations. I don't know if you guys are on Facebook or on Instagram or on TikTok or what uh, you're on, but if you go on any of these sites, or even if you just do a Google search for the word blessed, most likely what is going to come up is a picture of an abundant, wealthy lifestyle. You're most likely going to see photos of people with nice houses, nice cars, nice spray tans, nice hair, nice muscles, you know, like all that kind of stuff. That at the moment seems to be the general understanding in the modern Western world of what a blessed life is. But that is not what the author of the uh, Psalm Psalm 1 was. He was not, surprisingly, a Western uh, 21st century person. In fact, he was a uh, a Hebrew, a a person uh, from the nation of Israel, and he has a very different understanding of what this word blessed means. See, for them, they had this idea that the word blessed meant to be happy, And not just like a sense of happiness, but to have this sense of well-being and inner rightness within themselves, which is an interesting concept. But to unpack it further, it's basically the experience of having wisdom and and, and right relationships in how they interact with God, how they interact with others, how they interact with themselves, and how they interact with the circumstances that they find themselves in. Now, to clarify that, that's not circumstances are just always to their liking. It's they have wisdom and right decision-making around how to navigate the circumstances that they find themselves in. Ultimately, it kind of is this experience to be blessed, is to have this deep knowing that God loves you and is with you, and that means whatever you find yourself in, you know he is with you and working for you. See, this person with that experience would be considered wise in their dealings with God, with others, and how they handle their circumstances, and would be considered in that time to have a wise view of the world. That is the blessed person. Blessed is the one. That is the picture of the kind of person, the opportunity that the psalmist believes is available to us. Now, as I said, this is a wisdom psalm, so he is going to show us how it is that we can experience this blessed feeling uh, in our lives, this blessed experience uh, as we live. So it says, as it goes on, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers. Here's where the contrast around this idea of wisdom begins. And it starts with the very first thing being something that the wise person, the blessed person, does not do. It's very clear. It says that they don't walk in step with the wicked or stand in the company of sinners or sit with mockers. Now, when I was reading this passage, I found it striking that the idea of the words wicked, sinners, and mockers. And I, I was like, why have they used three different words? Well, the, the writer is actually trying to articulate three different characteristics of types of, uh, types of people uh, that the, uh, the wise person, the blessed person, uh, tries to uh, like avoid, but, but we'll unpack what that, that really means in a moment. But you just need to hear this carefully as we, as we dive into this, that, you know, the wicked, the sinners, and the mockers. This is not a call from the psalmist or from the Word of God to uh, remove ourselves from relationship and connection with people who don't believe the same thing as us. It's not this experience at all, but they're trying to help us understand something a little bit more, uh, a little bit more uh, intuitive, something a little bit deeper about how we're trying to uh, live our lives. See, when we understand what each of these different titles means, it kind of reveals what, uh, what the psalmist is trying to say. See, when he uses the word wicked, The wicked one is actually someone who was just considered at the time ignorantly sinful. 
you know, someone who just didn't realize what they were saying or what they were doing. You know the time like a kid comes home for the first time and says a word that they don't know the meaning of, but you're like, you really shouldn't say that word? That's kind of the idea that they're trying to get across here. You know, you don't really know, but you are kind of just walking on a slightly different path. Then we have the idea of the person who is a sinner. And this word uh, kind of has a connotation and a connection to someone who is uh, habitually and increasingly holistically going against God's commandments and leading. They're beginning to make a decision that they have actually found a different way to live their lives, and they're kind of beginning to choose that way and choose it intentionally. And then we see at the end this idea of the mocker. Now, the mocker is the one who scorns those who follow God's commandments, and they have contempt for God and those who follow him. So we can actually see that the psalmist is trying to make a progressive statement about the nature of these people. You know, he's trying to say that you can see the progressive view of the world shifting, you know, from someone who goes to accidentally and unintentionally choosing to live a life in in contrast to God's plan and purpose, to someone who is intentionally and deliberately, to someone who now outright goes against it and in fact stands against it harshly. And in each of these cases, these people believe they are choosing a path of wisdom that ultimately ends up with the scorner. And some of us may have heard people in these, uh, you know, in these positions or have these people in our world, people who say things such as religion is the opiate of the masses or the religion is the cause of all wars or that God is a delusion used to control people that we'd all be better off without. These kind of things are statements of supposed wisdom from them. These are the people that are going on this journey that the psalmist is encouraging us to be mindful of and careful with. And the real kicker is the words that he uses associated with them. He uses the words walk, stand, and sit. Walk with the wicked, stand with the sinners, sit with the scorners. And the reason for this is these are statements, again, about the type of relationship. You know, for many of us, as we walk around the shops, maybe not so much these days, maybe we're doing a little bit more online shopping uh, than we used to, but uh, we would often, like, walk around the shops, and you would walk around the presence of, you know, other people. You'd say, hey, or, you know, maybe say g'day, or just a little conversation uh, about whatever as you walk past, something about, like, I prefer those chips to those chips. You know, little things like that, right? It's a, it's a, it's a short conversation. It's a little bit of, like, engagement, but it's not real relationship. But if I was walking around the shops and I saw one of my youth leaders or one of my co-workers or one of my friends, normally I won't just be like, g'day mate, and then just keep walking. That seems a little bit rude, right? There's relationship here. I will stand with them, talk with them, have a conversation about what's happening in their life or what they're at the shops for. There's a little bit more intentionality and relationship to this, a little bit more influence both for me in their life but them in my life. But the idea of sitting, particularly in ancient Hebrew culture, was this idea of being invited into the person's house, sitting together, having a meal, spending time together. And and their meals were not just, you know, like often what we do, oh, let's grab a coffee, and somehow you always only sit there for an hour without even trying, and then you get up and leave. It's like you know that you've only got an hour associated with that. But they would spend hours. It was a long meal. It was like a feast. They would just spend time together, sitting, listening, talking. These are the people that you were closest with that you would most let into your life. Most likely, you would discuss everything, not just like the weather, but politics and your thoughts on the world and the Roman Empire and all that kind of stuff. And these would be people who would have a key influential uh, voice in how you saw the world, your worldview and your perspective. And so the psalmist is saying very quickly at the start that the blessed person, the wise person, the one who walks with wisdom is one who is careful of the company that they keep because they do not want to dwell on the wisdom of the world. They don't want these people to be the main influencing voices in their minds, in their decisions, in their perspectives. And so the psalmist is writing to us today the same thing, to if we want to be this person, we have to be mindful of the company that we keep because we do not want to dwell on the wisdom of the world. See, when I was talking with one of my housemates, uh, he was going through a, a situation at one time where he was trying to uh, navigate a difficult relationship that he was going through. Now, he was talking to me about it, and he mentioned that he'd had a conversation with one of our friends. Now, this friend of mine uh, hadn't been in a serious relationship since year eight, and even then, can that sentence even go together, serious relationship uh, in year eight? But he was, uh, hadn't really had much uh, relationship experience, but my friend was talking to him. Uh, about this situation, and I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was probably along those lines of like, you know, if you love them, let them go. If they're yours, they'll come back, or something stupid like that. And he was trying to give this advice. I was like, mate, that is not good advice. He said, why were you talking to him about this? 
So I don't know, he was there and I just, it was on my mind, so I thought I'd ask him about it. Now, there's nothing wrong with my friend. He was a great guy and he was trying his best. But I said, mate, why did you not access the garage session? Again, it haunts me that we didn't come up with a better name and merch it, but we didn't. Why did you not ask for a garage session? Get the boys together. There was two people in that group who were engaged. They were at least somewhat successful at that point. Uh, you know, they're married now, so they've, they've nailed it. But they were at least somewhat successful at that point in their relationship. Why would you not go and talk to them? Why would you not gather them around and have a bit more of a thorough conversation about what it is that you're going through? And so, there's, again, there's nothing wrong with him, but there's some wisdom over here that you can have access to. You're just choosing to listen to what's simple and easy and accessible for you. He was like, you know what? You're, exa- you're right. I should do that. And so he immediately got his phone out and just put in the group chat, boys, garage session tomorrow night, 7.30. Bring your chairs, you know? And then the boys were there and we had a great chat and he navigated that situation better. I mean, the relationship ended, but for a different reason. It's fine. You know, like the point of the story is he got good wisdom out of that moment. But it was, an, again, an example of who are the voices that you're listening to. You know, he just asked a friend, didn't think much of it, but he got some terrible advice in that situation, when he actually had access to a different sort of wisdom. And that is what the psalmist wants us to understand here. You know, he's made this contrast. This is what the wise person does not do. But here is what they actually do instead. And we see that it is they choose to delight in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on it day and night. This is the other option. Charles Spurgeon, reflecting on this passage, says this, the blessed person is not under the law as a curse and condemnation, but they are in it, and they delight to be in it as their rule of life. They delight, moreover, to meditate in it, to read by day and think upon it by night. See, the Word of God becomes this person's, the blessed person's, the wise person's guiding source of wisdom. See, this will be the source that they will use to determine their worldview, their plans, what constitutes wisdom, and even the relationships that they will build. But the thing that really stands out to me is notice the frequency. It is by day and by night. It's meditation. It's deep engagement with the Bible. This is what the blessed, the wise person does. And studies have shown the impact that it has on people who follow Jesus to engage regularly and deeply in the Word of God. See, the Center for Bible Engagement researched the difference that reading your Bible makes in the Christian life. And so they polled over 40,000 different individuals about their Bible reading habits and then their behavioral habits and you know, things that are valuable and important to, to Christians. What they found was startling. When you read the Bible and engage with it just once a week, like right now, like I've read the Bible, we're reading the Bible together, that's the only time you read and engage with the Bible for the whole entire week. They found that there is no real effect and no significant difference between a non-believer and a believer based on that. What they found was that when you go twice a week, again, there is no real effect. Three times a week, deep engagement in the Bible, they begin to see some small changes, some noticeable little things begin to happen. But what they found was the real shift happened when you begin to read and engage with your Bible deeply four times a week or more. Here is the things that they found. That actually when you do this, feelings of loneliness in the participants dropped 31%. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationship dropped 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. But there's a couple of really cool positive things that come out of it too. They found that those people who read the Bible four times or more, like deeply engaged with it a week, are 200% more likely to share their faith and 230% more likely to disciple others, and 401% more likely to memorize scripture. See, there's something about deep, intentional engagement in God's word that changes you. See, the blessed person doesn't dwell on the wisdom of the world, but they delight in the wisdom that's found in the word. See, the challenge for us is, do we delight in the word of God? Is it the place that we turn to for our source of wisdom? Is the Word of God a key voice in our decision-making? Is it the foundational feature of your worldview? 
because the research shows that you will notice it in your life if you do. I remember having to have a conversation with a youth leader early on in my uh, youth pastor days. He was uh, having a little too much fun on the weekend, if you know what I mean. And uh, some photos had made it onto social media and I wasn't able to miss them. I'd seen them, I'd recognized them and was like, okay, this is probably something that deserves a conversation. And so I organized to catch up with him and uh, I'm sure he was really excited to meet me at the coffee shop that day. He was probably like, this is gonna go great. And uh, as I was driving there, I really felt um, on my heart as I was praying for the conversation we were gonna have that God wanted me to help him grow close to him. He's like, in all of this, Ben, that is the ultimate goal, right? I know you need to talk to him about behavior and expectations, but we ultimately want him to get closer to me. And I was like, yep, that's true. We want to do that. So we started the conversation. We had a little chat about what had happened and what was going on. And then we just dived in. I said, mate, I want to know what's going on for you and how can I help you? And uh, he talked for a little while about a few things, but the key thing that he noted for himself was he's like, look, I've been praying, I've been doing all these things, but I haven't read the Bible in months. I think it would be really helpful for me to do that. He said, sure, we can, we can do that. How can, how can I help you do that? He said, look, I'd love some accountability and some support around it. I know it's important, but I struggle to do it. Can you, can you make that happen? Uh, at the time, there was one of my other youth leaders who I'm almost certain thought the Bible was the only book that existed because I'm pretty sure that's the only thing I ever saw him carry and read. But uh, he loved it. He was always in it. And I'm pretty sure he only spoke in Bible verses, but he was the, per- he was the perfect person to support this guy uh, on this journey. And so I, I paired them up and got them, got them talking and be, be, just begun to notice some things changed. You know, this guy was coming to my uh, life group and he would normally come, he'd be there on time, but he wouldn't really engage deeply in what was going on. But over a period of a month or so, he started bringing his Bible to life group. He was like, oh, that's cool, you know, great, well done, that's awesome. And a little later after that, he began to share what he'd been seeing. He'd be like, you know, I'd never read this passage before, and I read it for the first time, and it blew my mind and just opened me up to, I'd never realized. And, you know, like, oh, I read this parable, and I didn't notice this, or I noticed that. And he just began to share all these, uh, these really cool stories about what God was doing and, and sharing and uh, revealing to him in his word. Eventually, though, he uh, moved over to the UK and uh, decided he was going to just go on an adventure over there. And it was like, okay, that's really cool. But it was always a little bit like, I wonder what's going to happen for him uh, when he goes over there and loses a bit of the community around him and support or whatever. But uh, I randomly got a message from him probably like 18 months to two years ago, um, just before the pandemic and everything was going on. And he'd messaged me saying, hey, I would um, love to have a phone call with you. I was like, okay, this is interesting. UK phone call. Sure, sounds good. And uh, we organized a time and we got on the phone and he said, look, I'm, I'm actually considering talking to my church about volunteering as the youth pastor here because they need someone to do it. And I just think it's something I'd love to do. And I was like, sitting there like, whoa, this is cool. Because as a youth pastor, this is the dream, right? You know, like you take someone who's kind of on the edges and and resting a little bit with their faith. And then they've gone all this way to like, I just want to serve God as much as I possibly can. And uh, we were talking about it. And he talked about just how he'd been spending heaps of time in the word and been praying and just was just felt like God really wanted him to use that to invest in the lives of the next generation of young people. And uh, I remember getting off that phone call going, I just remember where you were and I see where you are now, and to see how much the Word of God was an influencing factor in his decision and his trajectory uh, was incredible. But it's been an incredible reminder again of the importance and the value of delighting in the Word of God and the fruit that it ultimately produces for us. Now, in this passage, it does talk about the fact that for us uh, blessed people, the wise people, the ones who decide to delight in the Word of God, that we will be like a tree planted near water that will produce its fruit in season. And again, fruit is often this word that we think of prosperity, we think of provision, we think of great things happening for us, but it's actually something richer and better than that. See, the fruit in season is an important idea for us to understand when we read the Word of God. Charles Spurgeon, reflecting on that phrase, producing its fruit in season, again says this, that the blessed person, the wise person, brings forth their fruit in season, not unseasonable graces like untimely figs, which are never full-flavored, but the one who delights in God's Word, being taught by it, bringeth forth patience in the time of suffering, faith in the day of trial, and holy joy in the hour of prosperity." Fruitfulness is an essential quality of a gracious person, and that fruitfulness should be seasonable. See, it's ultimately this fruit that leads us to walk in the ways of wisdom. It's this fruit that helps us navigate the unpredictable nature of life because the Word produces in us the patience to endure suffering, 
The peace in the midst of confusion, knowing that God is in control. The joy in prosperity, because we're reminded of God's goodness and providence to us. The love for those persecuting us, because we're reminded that God loves them just as much as he loves us. The faithfulness to stay the course, because we've seen a God be so faithful to us. The kindness to care for those in need around us. And the self-control to hold our tongues when we just want to give someone a serve. But all of this comes from delighting in the word of God. See, Dane Ortland says in his devotional book on the Psalms about this same passage, he says that this verse teaches us that nothing can compare with the blessedness, the fruitfulness, the flourishing, the prospering, the delightfulness of a life saturated with the Word of God. So, will you dwell on the wisdom of the world or delight in the wisdom of the word. Because as we finish the psalm, we're reminded of the outcome of that choice. See, if verse three describes the blessed person as a person planted uh, by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers, verses four, five, and six outlay the rest. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. See, we're reminded that the wisdom of the word is the way that the the Lord watches over. And as we read the rest of the Psalms, we have to be reminded of the fact that when we walk in the way of wisdom, it doesn't always lead to prosperity and joy and simplicity. You know, we are going to have moments, just as they have in the rest of the Psalms, where there is frustration felt that the other way seems more prosperous. The other way seems more fruitful. The other way seems more fun. The other way seems to lead to more influence. The other way seems to even be oppressing us in the midst of all that we go through. Yet we have to remind ourselves again and again that if we walk under the wisdom found in the Word of God, we know that He watches the way that we walk. And Psalm 23 paints the picture even more clearly for us of what it looks like when we walk in that way. See, it says in verses one to four that the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So you notice here that as he walks with God, he walks both beside quiet waters and green fields as well as through the darkest valley. But what is it that holds firm is the fact that God is with him, that he knows that he is walking in the way that God has for him, that God watches over him in the easy seasons and the hard seasons, that God provides him the fruits that he needs, whether that's rest or a guiding rod and staff. See, Psalm 1 is not ending with a promise that God will walk ahead of you and remove every single obstacle, lift up all of the valleys, flatten down all of the hills, make the path as straight as possible. But rather, it is, not, it is saying that when we understand the way that we walk, when we walk in the way of wisdom, we can live with a sense of peace, well-being, and rightness in the midst of it all. Because as we delight in the law of the Lord, we walk in the way that he watches over. And I think that's important for us this morning as we look at the year ahead. I don't know about you, but I think sometimes we thought 2022 would be the year that it would get easier or simpler. But there's probably a sense of nervousness, trepidation, uncertainty, confusion. And let's be real, any time we start a year and think we know what's going to happen, we're kidding ourselves. Every single year, we'll have some highlights that we never saw coming. We'll have some lowlights that we never thought we'd have to deal with and a whole bunch in between that was never part of our plan. But we do recognize that when we have the Word of God as the foundational feature of our worldview, as the source of our wisdom, we can walk through it and navigate it in such a way that we know that God walks with us through it all. The thing that blows my mind about this psalm, though, is that the psalmist is encouraging the people to dwell on a delight in the law of the Lord. And at the time, most likely all they had was the first five books of what we now call the Bible, the law, the Torah and potentially a collection of some of these psalms. That is what the psalmist is inviting his readers at that time to do, to meditate on those, to learn them, to know them, to understand them. 
And what blows my mind is the fact that they were encouraging them that in these five books and a few Psalms, you could find wisdom and light and a way forward. And here we are in the year 2022 with a Bible that has 66 books in it, littered with stories of the heroes of our faith and the way that they navigated some difficult and trying circumstances, stories of God's miraculous power at work. And not just that, we get the New Testament where we get to see God made flesh, Jesus walking amongst us and the wisdom and the way that he lived his life. And we have the opportunity to not just guess, but to imitate. All of this made available to us and we can delight in it all and it can be the source of our wisdom, the foundational feature of our worldview. See, the encouragement in this psalm to each of us is to not dwell on the wisdom of the world, but to delight in the wisdom found in the Word of God. That that is what's going to give us the confidence, peace, and rightness in our lives as we navigate the situations and circumstances that come our way. And as we touched on earlier, reading it and engaging with it deeply will genuinely change your life. So what does it look like for you this year to make the Word a priority? I know for many of us, we've probably tried this time and time again. We've probably tried to make it more of a habit. We've tried to, uh, to stick to it. We've tried to finish a Bible reading plan. I don't know what it is. My encouragement might be it's time to get creative. Try something new. Try something you haven't done before. If you tried time and time again to read the Bible in the morning and it's never worked, why don't you try reading it at night? Like just before you go to bed, read a chapter. Why don't you just try memorizing one verse and then just thinking about it throughout the week? Just sit on it, reflect on it, meditate on it. Why don't you try an audio Bible? Listen to it on your way to work, on the train or in the car or even at the gym. I've done that when I've fallen behind my Bible reading plan, just lifting weights, listening to the Word of God. You know, like, why not? No one knows. Get it in here. Maybe you need a drawing journal. Maybe that's part of it for you. You actually, you read it, but you don't like just trying to think about it. You want to draw what's been coming to you. Maybe you just need a journal to write it down. Maybe you need to do a YouVersion Bible app plan where you get some people around you. You know, last year, I always wanted to read the Bible in a year. I asked some friends to help me do it. I did it, not because I was good at it, but because they would message me and be like, Ben, you've fallen seven days behind again. I'm like, all right, I'm going to the gym and I'm putting my audio Bible on. You know, like, do what you need to do to get it in your life. Like, do you need people? Do you need to talk to your life group? Do you need to message some friends? Whatever it is, make this a priority to delight in the wisdom that's found in the Word. And so today, that is my simple encouragement to you. Just find a way to do it more regularly. If you can, seems like from the research, the magic number is four times a week. But you can never spend too much time in the Word of God. You can never spend too much time trying to mine it for the wisdom and life that is found within it. And I'm sure that as you do that, the delight will grow as you walk in the ways that the Lord watches over. And so this morning, I'd love to take a moment to pray for us before we come together to sing a song that is going to remind us of the wisdom that is found in God and the fact that we as people should continue to look to Him as the source of our wisdom and vision this year. So Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for the fact that we can come before You and we can worship You and we can, uh, we can spend time just in Your Word, Lord, listening to the lessons that it has for us. And God, I pray that today you would challenge each of us to spend more time delighting in the wisdom that is found in your word than dwelling on the wisdom of the world, Lord. And God, I pray that as we do that, we would have this, uh, this blessedness, this inner peace and quiet assurance that we're walking in the ways that you watch over, Lord, that you are with us, that you are for us, and you're working through us, Lord. And God, I pray that you would just stir us to be a people that seek your word first, Lord, that it would be the foundational feature of our worldview. And God, I pray these things in your mighty and powerful name. Amen. We hope you've been blessed by this message. We are a growing family and we'd love to see you at one of our Sunday services because everyone who comes through our doors is welcome. You can find out more about our community and locations at gatewaybaptist.com.au.